Good evening. We are live here in the Trinity Channel's ABN studios, and I'm not sure what camera to look at. I'm a little rusty here. Here, I'll go with this one. Mm -hmm. Chris Conway here live in the studio. So glad that you're here watching us tonight. Uh, it's 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time here from our studio, and I say our because I'm sharing the studio with my good friend and co-host, Naran and Wea. Good evening, Naran. Good How evening, we? Chris. How are you? I'm great. Good to see you again. Nice so we're going to we're gonna do a little tag team here, uh, and we're going to have... Uh, the topic for tonight's program and, and really so glad to have all of you watching tonight and we're excited to bring forth another broadcast here live on the internet on trinitychannel.com or also the, uh, the Trinity and the Trinity Channel and, and Aramaic Broadcast Network. We have tonight's program which is 90 minutes in length. Uh, the topic for tonight is Islam and the genocide of minorities in the Middle East. Islam and the genocide of minorities in the Middle East. Of course, a topic that's very close, uh, near and dear to Naren's heart and, mm -hmm. and many of us, obviously, uh, the terrible tragedy that are going on. Uh, but we have uh, a, thing, not a lot of ground to cover, a lot of discussion to have. We've got three guests calling in on Skype tonight. Two of them are currently on Skype. One will be joining us in about a half hour. But uh, I'm gonna have Naren, if you could read uh, the bio for our, uh, our uh, initial guest here. Yeah. Uh, we right have um, Dr. Richard Schumach. He's a research fellow with the Center for Public Christianity in Sydney, Australia, and the director of the Arthur Jeffrey Center for Islamic Studies at Melbourne School of Theology. He's part of the Rabbi Zacharias International Ministries Understanding and Answering Islam team, and he teaches regularly on engaging with Islam in Australian seminaries, universities, churches, and mission organizations. Dr. Schumach is the author of two books, one of which is a training book called Witnessing to Western Muslims, a Worldview Approach to Sharing Faith. He has also a philosophical apologetic entitled The Wisdom of Islam and the Foolishness of Christianity. Welcome to the show, Dr. Schumach. So glad to have you on. Uh, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Fantastic, Doctor. And uh, we're going to get... Uh, Started here, but I'm going to read our next guest, the bio for our next guest. Uh, I say next, but it's, they're all going to kind of be mixed in here. Uh, uh, this is uh, Dr. Tony Costa, who, <coughs> excuse me, Dr. Tony has been, excuse me, <coughs> I'm sorry, live television, live, live internet here, um, has been in our program many times before, and we're so glad to have our, our dear friend and brother in the Lord uh, back with us again tonight. And, and I'm going to go ahead and read... Uh, uh, a verse that's at the top of uh, Tony's bio, and that is, examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do, not, do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you, unless, of course, you fail the test? And that is 2 Corinthians 13.5. And so uh, I'll read here. It says in front of me, Tony Costa has earned a BA and, M and an MA in the study of religion from the University of Toronto. He has also earned a PhD with Radboud University in the Netherlands, in the Netherlands uh, Tony is also a member of the Society of Biblical Literature, uh, the Evangelical Theological Society, and the Evangelical Philosoph Philosophical Society. His area of expertise is biblical and systematic theology, cults, the New Age movement, and comparative world religions. Uh, uh, Tony is also an ordained minister. As a Christian apologist, Dr. Costa uh, gives reasons for the valid belief in Christianity and also advocates the unique claims of Jesus Christ. Uh, Tony frequently lectures in various churches and events throughout the Ontario and the United States, and he has been a guest on various television programs such as 100 Huntley Street, uh, the Michael Corrin Live Show, the Arena with Michael Corrin, uh, the Arlene uh, Bynan uh, Show on Prime Time, uh, the Rhonda London Live Show, and on, and on the line with Christine Williams. He has also been a radio guest on CFRB one, uh, 1010 and Huntley Street Radio on WDCX 99 FM. As a defender of the faith, Tony has engaged in debates with Muslims, Mormons, atheists, secular humanists, and other groups that challenge the historic Christian faith. Tony has lectured at the University of Toronto, 
uh, York University, McMaster University, the University of Guelph, the University of Waterloo, uh, Wilfrid Laurier University, Ryerson University, Queen's University, the University of Ottawa, Humber College, and Tyndale University College. He also lectures at various universities on the existence of God, as well as the credibility of the Christian faith. Tony continues to speak at many events sponsored by Power to Change and the University Christian Fellowship. And there are other things here I'll mention, but that will I'll uh, hold off. But there's so many things that Tony. It's amazing. I've been got exhausted just saying all those, sharing all the things about your bio. Obviously, you're you're a busy man, and you love the Lord, and you continue to serve Him. And obviously, God has blessed you and blessed your ministry, and given you opportunity to speak and defend the faith in many different venues. And we welcome you here again tonight. Thank you, Chris. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Well, so the topic here tonight, um, it was, again, Islam and the genocide of minorities in the Middle East. And we will have eventually with us in about oh, a little less than a half hour now, Edip Yuxel, who is uh, going to be representing the Islamic point of view. Uh, and Edip will be uh, joining us uh, roughly around 8.30 Eastern Standard Time. Uh, but uh, so as we look at the title of tonight's program, uh, Islam and the genocide of minorities in the Middle East, Kind of a heavy topic, uh, you know. Uh, I suspect at the end of this program, we will, we could, we could take that conversation perhaps and put it a year ago or a year from now, and maybe not much has changed because it continues to be a horrible, horrible thing that's going on. Um, Absolutely, Chris. And you know, as we were discussing how many inter you know shows we've done together discussing the current genocide not even exactly addressing the previous genocides that many minorities have been facing where many of them today are facing an extinction a possible extinction because of the consistent rates of genocides but it's very unfortunate that in today's time many people are suffering a current genocide and it has been active for a little over two years now mm -hmm. okay uh when when we when we talk about this, when you hear this topic, uh, Islam and the genocide of minorities in the Middle East, um, it seems to me it's getting, it's getting continually worse. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Schumach, what would you say, uh, uh, based on your observations of what's happening, uh, what, how would you say, if, are things changing, worsening? Are there, is there any unique developments? Your observations as you uh, perhaps see what's going on, you know, with, with this horrible genocide. Right. And, and just to clarify, when we're talking genocide, uh, clearly what we're talking about is ISIS and the campaigns that they are involved in and the, uh, the elimination of who they perceive as enemies. And in that context, in Syria and in Iraq, um, Obviously, it's horrible, and the activities they're involved in are, I mean, they're abhorrent, and they really are aimed at eliminating all those who they, they don't perceive as genuine Muslims or um, people who are on board with their state. Um, what I hear about the particular situation is that um, ISIS is, it's contracting. They've recently lost a number of very significant battles and they've lost control of certain areas. Um, so I think things are probably getting a bit better, but that certainly doesn't make it any easier for the uh, people on the ground who are still suffering under their regime. And also the very many refugees who are suffering, not just there, but on the refugee highway out of uh, that part of the world. So the suffering is still very, very great even though I think ISIS is diminishing, at least uh, at the current time. Okay. Um, Dr. Tony Costa, what, is there a, a people group um, that, and it's probably a loaded question here, that, that uh, ISIS and radical, and radical Islamic terrorists uh, are targeting? Um, I mean, I think one obvious question would be innocent people and Christians, but what, what would you say, is, there, is, is it... Is it broadening? And what, what, uh, what uh, areas are? What, is there a priori prioritization when it comes to attacking a particular people group? You know, is there a strategy, or what? What, what can you say about that? 
Maybe okay, well, another good way is what is exactly a genocide? Because a lot of people don't really understand what a genocide is. What would that be? Yeah, gen a genocide by definition is usually defined as the destruction or elimination, a complete wholesale elimination of a people group. And so in particular, uh, in, in the Middle East where ISIS is in control, and I think we have to understand that what is fueling ISIS and what is fueling their activities, it's very important to note that it is the Islamic text, that it is not just the Quran, it's the Hadith, it's the Sunnah of the Prophet. And in particular, uh, Surah 929, which calls for the violent subjugation of the people of the book uh, to embrace Islam, or if not, to pay the jizya, which they are doing uh, under the ISIS uh, regime. Um, and I think it's also important to realize that what, what they are targeting in particular, I mean, there are the last remnant of Jews have, have finally evacuated, apparently, from, uh, from uh, Yemen and uh, other parts of the Middle East. There's virtually no Jews left. Uh, I think the last count was there was one Jew left in Afghanistan. Um, but uh, Christians in particular are the primary targets uh, in Syria and in Iraq. And that again goes back to the um, the command to wage warfare against the people of the book in Surah 929, and also the Yazidis. The Yazidis, of course, are a sectarian group within Islam. They're targeted as well. We've heard of all the Yazidi girls who were abducted as sex slaves, uh, as per Surah 4, verse 3. And also, we have to understand that the laws of warfare or jihad in the Quran also mandate the killing of of hypocrites. So. Uh, there are Muslims who are deemed to be hypocrites who either betray the, the, the jihadist cause or they may be apostates in the sense that they don't believe that jihad is part of Islam. So that th this jihad is primarily against Christians at the moment. It does include sectarian Muslim groups like the Yazidis. Shias are, are also legitimate targets, um, but also uh, hypocrites within Islam. So when we hear President Obama say that ISIS is killing Muslims, that's true. But what he's not saying is the fact that ISIS is killing Muslims that they deem to be uh, hypocrites, those who do not practice what they preach. And according to the Quran, it mandates the killing of hypocrites as well as the, uh, the kafir, the, the unbelievers. Very well said, Tony. So yes, absolutely. And I have to add on to that too. So the religious minorities or the ethnic minorities in Iraq and Syria of many are also Assyrian Christians who are also religiously known as Chaldeans and Syriacs. Um, and of course the Turkmans, you know, and definitely some Shia Muslims that are being um, killed as well. So one thing to my understanding is the Shias and the Sunnis have been at a religious war between each other for so long. And recently there was a genocide acknowledgement by the United States Congress where House Resolution 75 actually passed um, and they acknowledged finally the Christian genocide and you know and it includes the Assyrians um, the Yazidis and also the Shia Muslims but to me you know the Shia Muslims I I feel for any innocent human that is being massacred in great numbers but really the Muslims have been at war with each other for so long it's just the jihad it's a constant jihad between each other a lot of times uh, indigenous people like the Assyrians and the Yazidis are caught in the middle between these people and also in between the Kurdish Muslims too. Um, another strategy of genocide is also annihil annihilating their historical artifacts like the Lamassu, the Nineveh wall that is actually even more historical than the Great Wall of China. The Nineveh wall from the biblical city and ancient historical city of Nineveh, the Nineveh wall has been completely blown to pieces and uh, many many priceless artifacts and historical landmarks um, so it appears that they're also targeting not only the religious sector of these people but also the ancient sector completely eliminating their identity so that they can restart a new breed a new generation and um, and I also believe that part of this genocide besides the religious fanaticism there's a lot of uh, dirty politics being played by the by the religious extremists there who are in leadership um, like in the case of Iraq and Syria there's a lot of um, areas 
like land thefts that are occurring. So there's a demographic change. So part of the genocide is removing these ancient people out and the Christians and re replacing them with Muslims, whether they're Arab Muslims, Kurdish Muslims, um, but, or any other type of Muslim. They're replacing their geographic areas they have inhabited for thousands of years, which is a really, really slick way of another modern type of genocide. It's like an extension of genocide in a way. Exactly. It's, it's not only if anyone can watch the character to commonize, but it seems like they want to wipe out the current generation mm -hmm. and even wipe out the memory of ancient generations. Yes, and there was actually um, an undercover that reported to me from Mosul, which is completely occupied by ISIS, a complete red zone, and he told me that not only are they blowing up the churches and just destroying any religious areas, but there, he saw ISIS terrorists leaned over a bridge. This ancient bridge in Mosul, which Mosul is an ancient part of ancient Nineveh, but it was an Arabized name that they made into Mosul. He was leaned over the bridge and carving out the ancient historical Mesopotamian Assyrian uh, calligraphy and writing and carvings into the bridge. How is this bridge interfering with an extremist? So that's also, they want to, like you said, mm -hmm. remove any trace of any ethnic, civilized minorities, uh, any trace to Christianity, to any religion that's not theirs. And, you know, it's like a genocide, a breed of genocide that I don't even believe anyone has ever seen hmm. to this degree. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a hyped up version of genocide, perhaps. Mm -hmm. When I think of the word, you know, there's suicide, there's homicide, there's a side is a killing. You mm -hmm. know, so we have, a, in this case, a massive killing of, of, a, of a people group. Mm -hmm. And maybe we can ask Dr. Schumach. So what do you believe is going through these people's mind to commit genocide? Like, what is the main reason besides, you know, the persecution of their religion? Um, and we discussed some, you know, just dis destroying historical artifacts. What is the main reason why people like ISIS or any other extremist Islamic groups want to commit genocide? In your personal opinion. The mindset behind ISIS is um, it's a crucial question to understand, particularly because we have many Western Muslims, whether they're from the UK, from the US, from Australia, um, from Canada, who are traveling to the Middle East to join the fight. And so these are people who certainly the factors that contribute to the rise of ISIS are complicated. There are political factors, as you mentioned, there are tribal factors. So ISIS originally was a grouping of Sunni tribes and they were reacting against the fact that the Shia had gained power in Iraq. And so you had this sort of tribal political element. You also have social elements. You have people feeling disaffected. You have historical elements. The arguments there are, like you're saying, they're going back thousands of years even. Um, but it's very hard for that to explain why Western Muslims would want to get involved. What's the mindset there? That's not their fight. And so at that point, it's important to understand that the mindset, and Tony picked up on it, it's very ideologically driven. It's theologically, ideologically driven. Um, even if the, the, the origins of the fight, if you like, weren't rooted in Islam, they might have been rooted politically, they might have been rooted socially. What Islam has done and the ideology, the jihadist Salafi ideology has done, is it enables people to justify that sort of behavior because they think they're killing not out of evil, but they think they're doing it in the name of God. They don't think that they're involved in genocide. What they think they're involved in is establishing a just state and eliminating all opposition. It's very much a theological ideology that... Um, traditional and particularly Islamist or jihadi Islam is enabling, is fueling, as Tony said, or is driving along. It's, it's a way that for people to justify getting on board with that um, and still not thinking that they are doing evil, even though clearly what's happening is um, outrageously evil. It's just a different, it's an, an ignorance of the truth. And, you know, we believe, you know, we, we know the truth, those of us who uh, profess Christ, and yet, you know, 
they, they have an allegiance to the, the, the Quran and Allah and the, word, the, word, the, the writings of Muhammad. And we're not, you know, it, what would help us, you know, and we do have Edith uh, uh, Yuxal on the line with us now. Um, uh, Dr. Costa, Dr. Schumach, what would help us as Christian people uh, to not agree with, but at least be, begin to understand what, what, the, what is behind the mindset of a Muslim? Right. Can I just, just one thing, the one helpful idea is that um, certainly traditional Islam and absolutely the sort of Islam that ISIS is operating under, the way they think of faith, the way they think of religion, and the word I'm going to use here is nomocracy. I know it's a big word, but nomocracy is the rule of law. Essentially, what traditional Islam is, it's the rule of law. It's the rule of the Sharia. And what you do in implementing religion is you implement the law. You enforce the law. You enforce the law on people who are willing to submit to it. You enforce the law on people who are not willing to submit to it. And you enforce laws, which means you enforce Islam. And so what they're doing is they are enforcing Islam. And as Tony mentioned, you have uh, Quran chapter 9, verse 29, which says, you enforce it on unbelievers, but either they submit to you and pay your tax or you kill them. And people are looking at them and then saying, well, we're doing it for the good of all of society. We want to enforce Islam because we think they're good laws. Now, as a Christian, I don't think they're good laws. I think they're clearly they're evil laws. And you're seeing the fruit of that playing out in the horrible situation that you have there. But that's the mindset. We're trying to enforce these laws for the sake of God, for the sake of creating a society. It's a twisted mindset, but it's people who believe that law enforcement is the thing that will change the world. Whereas as Christians, we believe that heart transformation is the thing that changes the world, not outside or enforcing from the top down or from laws. Laws don't change hearts. The spirit changes hearts. I think it's a perfect opportunity with that comment to have uh, our, uh, our third guest of our program. Edith Buxall, are you there? Yes, I am here. Hi. Hello, nice how are you? Uh, good. Well, I came late. I was just, I've been listening to you about for five, ten minutes. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, um, I, thanks yes. for joining us. I, I hear some music in the background. Is it, is it just my ears or do you Sounds hear that? beautiful. It's kind of nice. Okay. Well, maybe later we'll play that. Yeah. We'll what, play who, who, who was that, by the way? Is that, is that something, is that, uh, do you know what that was? It was very good. Maybe Chris, you can Are play you on your to Pandora. Me? Maybe. <laughs> I'm just, we were just curious what the music was, but that's okay. That's okay. I what, don't think he can hear you. Are you, are you hearing us okay? Are you talking about me? Y yes. yes. We were asking you yeah, what the, I, I, go ahead. I didn't have music. Uh, it was just a fan. Okay. Was running. So oh. what, uh, <laughs> well, we heard it here, but thank you. But listen, thanks for joining our program tonight. We have Dr. Richard Schumack on, on Skype with us as well as uh, Dr. Tony Costa. And uh, we welcome, uh, Naren and I uh, welcome you to our program as well tonight, which is uh, just for those who are w tuning in perhaps that uh, uh, just watching now, the title of tonight's program is, is Islam and the Genocide of Minorities in the Middle East. And so um, what would you say, the comment that was made uh, by Dr. Shimak, uh, regards to how does Islam uh, 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 rule, let's say, uh, uh, the comment was made that uh, Islam wishes to use laws to govern people and people groups and countries, and with uh, Christianity, those who profess Christ, we let uh, Christ, Christ uh, Jesus Christ stir our hearts and have our hearts uh, be the ones that control uh, how we behave and how we live and how we treat others. How, what would you say to that? And, and, uh, and may I get your name? I'm sorry. I didn't do that. Did I? I'm Chris, yeah. Chris, Chris Conway. And oh, Chris and Conway. Marie Chris. Conway. Thank you. We've met before. It's been a little while, but good to, to have you yes. in our, on a program okay. tonight. So Chris, did you catch uh, my question? I got your question. Yeah. Okay. I, I know about uh, your theme. 
you are here to basically uh, bash Islam and the Quran and Muhammad and say these are the evil and they commit genocide and uh, ultimately we are the right people, we are the best people on earth and uh, that's uh, the summary of your talk and uh, I see many religious people, Muslims, Sunnis, Shiites, Catholics and stuff what I see general pattern they don't look at the mirror in themselves and uh, I see the, when I talk to the Muslims I say you don't have to write criticize the Western world you are your own enemy when you have little power you become a tyrant a pharaoh uh, in your family you oppress your children or women you bury them in sacks black sacks and when you become a king you become a tyrant too therefore first of all you have problem and you have uh, a lot of vicious laws like stoning to death like uh, killing the apostate there is no freedom of expression and all this stuff I have uh, crit uh, criticized them uh, since 30 years I have been debating this through my books and lectures and I've been receiving death threats from ISIS Al-Qaeda and many other groups I lost my close friend to terrorist attack in the United States in fact it was considered Al-Qaeda's first terrorist attack in the United States in 1990 January he was killed in Tucson Dr. Rashad Khalifa however when I look at the West, recently I had a, a tour in Europe, in Germany, I talked to Germans. I said, do you have patience with me, Chris, a little bit, a few minutes? We, we, uh, we do. We're going to go to a break soon, but we'll, we'll, you just okay. joined the program, so go ahead. And uh, I, I told them, I said, uh, you are as hypocrite as the Eastern part, as the Muslims are, because the most biggest weapon manufacturers it is the western world and the biggest wars in this last century was committed by the west millions of people killed by christians it was, they were not muslims and uh, you you see you don't see what you do for example let's say look at where al-qaeda came about al-qaeda came in afghanistan in fact professor dr pape he is the number one who has done research on terrorism he has done evaluated 4600 suicide cases his doctor chicago university uh, professor dr pape robert pape if you look at it he finds very uh, strong relationship between occupations and this kind of uh, things for example in afghanistan there was russian occupation they killed tons of thousands of Afghanis, then United States occupation again. In Iraq, the same occupation, and guess what? Gave birth to ISIS. And they were there, the same teaching, this evil teaching that I, I mentioned, few of them, it was there, dormant. But when you go invade the country, it kills hundreds of thousands, close to a million in Iraq, what do you expect? And, uh, like, and we don't call just let me finish you don't call terrorism when Christians or Jews do the same thing even worse for example Serbs they committed suicide against Bo Bosnians they were Christians and it was Christians versus Muslims but never the Western media never used the Christian terrorist or there was Norway massacre more than 60 uh, young ch children were killed by a Christian who professed to be Christian who had cross here who was used to read the Robert Spencer's book you never called him a Christian terrorist or just two years ago my dear friend brothers two years ago Israel attacked Gaza claiming that there were rockets coming 1500 rockets which killed no one and they attacked in uh, in few days they killed 2000 Palestinians 500 of them being children during that course of attack my dear peaceful Christian friend and when they killed, they, they attack hospitals on the guise of terrorists are there, terrorists hiding behind children. 500 children, United Nations many times condemned Israel's attack to schools and hospitals. 2,000 Palestinians, let me finish last sentence. They killed 2,000 Palestinians. What did the Western world do? What did Christians do? They, 
express their regret for two soldiers Israel lost during this attack to civilians. Mm -hmm. It was a Jewish terrorism, uh -huh. which is found in the Bible, in the Old Testament and New Testament. There are many, a lot, killing, 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 massacring children and women. Therefore, when I look at both sides, in both sides there is hypocrisy. Both sides do not see their atrocities in the name of God. Okay, thank you. I know you have a lot on your chest, and we appreciate that, and welcome to our show. We're going to have to share our time together, though. We have about an hour left, and we will be going to a break real soon here. In fact, we're going to a break right now. So on that note, since we have all of our guests have been uh, uh, allowed to speak a little bit here, we'll uh, continue after this brief break. Again, uh, our program, Islam and the Genocide of Minorities in the Middle East, stay with us. Did you know that ABN and Trinity Channel is currently spreading the Word of God in four different languages to five continents? ABN is a multilingual satellite TV network that is broadcasting in English, Arabic, Aramaic, and Kurdish languages. <laughs> Jesus Christ, oh hallelujah, he's not just the prophet far greater than Muhammad, but he is the Son of God. And at one day, every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. <laughs> Did you know that we are also building awareness to the West about jihad and terrorism through Christian apologetics? Terrorist groups, ISIS, and Islamic jihadists continue to become an increasing problem in the world. This is one of our many challenges that we are facing today. Would you like to stand with us in declaring the truth through our Lord Jesus Christ? By your prayers and support, we will be able to continue the good work through ABN and Trinity Channel. Your support is always welcomed and needed. To donate, please visit our website at trinitychannel.com and click donate. Or call the number at your screen. It is not you who chose me, but I who chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit that will remain so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Just asking a clarification on your answer. Saudi Arabia is the perfect picture of Islam, and you support the royal family of Saudi Arabia. You support that government. We are called to bear fruit that will last. Here at ABN, we pray for support in allowing this fruit, which is spreading the word of God throughout the nations to grow. Currently, ABN is broadcasting to more than four continents worldwide on three major satellites, including North America, Europe, Australia, North Africa, and the Middle East. And the Lord Jesus Christ is God who's come to rescue and save us. He took my sin, my shame, my pain. At some point, you have to have a, a first cause an uncaused cause or an uncreated creator. Jesus Christ took my place. He was my representative. And when we defend these things, we give glory and praise to God. Live with God the Father and Jesus and the Holy Spirit in the next life. We are calling on to you to help allow the fruit to last by supporting our ministry. Please send your donations to the address at your screen. P.O. Box 724 Wild Lake, Michigan 48390. Or you can also donate through our ABN app. Or call the numbers at your screen. 
Oh, and welcome back. It's uh, uh, roughly uh, about a half, yeah, about a half hour half after the hour here. Easy for me to say. And again, 8.30 Eastern Standard Time. And we're uh, having our discussion here with our three de uh, guests, uh, Dr. Richard Schumach, Dr. Tony Costa, and also Edith Yuxel. And uh, we are uh, in the middle of talking about the, 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 the program, the title for the program tonight is Islam and the Genocide of Minorities in the Middle East. And uh, Naren, you, you had made some notes, some questions. Uh, yes. I'd like to ask them. Edith, we've got, Naren has so, some questions for you. Some of my background is I'm um, an activist, so I advocate for the persecuted uh, Assyrian Christians, including, you know, also religiously known as Chaldeans and Syriacs in Iraq and Syria, who are the natives, the indigenous people of those areas, and also minorities such as Yazidis, and I've even advocated for other persecuted um, between each other uh, sectors of uh, the religious Islamic groups who were innocent and moderate and caught in the crossfires in this horrible genocide. But um, my question is, it's obviously very evident in the Middle East, and I'm speaking of Iraq and Syria because that's where the current genocide is primarily right now. It is very evident Besides the, we understand there's a lot of uh, political corruption that's involved of very, very big money that's funding this, of course, but it is evident that Islam there, radical Islam, has been a huge issue, not just because since the rise of ISIS or since the issue that's been going on since the state of Israel has been established, this has been going on, and I could give a report on behalf of our people, the native Assyrians of those areas. We've been suffering this since the rise of Islam. Um, at a point in the Middle East, before Iraq was Iraq, before Syria was Syria, before a lot of those um, Arab countries were established by countries like the British and the Western countries who played a huge role there, it was known as Assyria. There were at a point, 30 million Assyrians. Since the rise of Islam, right now we have decreased just in Iraq alone. As of now, you won't even believe this number. We are 300,000. And my great grandfathers, just a personal testimony, if nothing else is believed, both of my great grandfathers were killed by Islamic radicals, particularly, particularly um, Kurdish Muslims who occupied their lands, and they asked them to convert. They wouldn't convert. One of my great-grandfathers was crucified on a cross. The other one was stabbed to death by three different radicals. Um, this is something, a story that many will tell you from Iraq and Syria, mainly Iraq especially, since we're so vulnerable there. Um, so what is your answer to that? We're, I'm basing it on actual testimonies, on incidences, you know, the reality of what's happening in Iraq. What is your answer to that, Mr. Edip? What's your name? Nahran. So my name in Aramaic is Nahran. Nahran. Yes. Uh, thank you. Well, uh, I, I empathize with you. I share your grief and uh, whatever feelings you have against these people who committed this. Uh, I am with you. I have no sympathy or empathy for those who commit heinous crimes, especially in the name of God. And uh, I do agree that in that part of the world, and uh, I call them not Muslims, I call them Sunni and Shiite. To me, the definition of Islam is very clear according to the Quran. I translate the Quran into two languages, Turkish and English. In English, one is Quran, a reformist translation. Islam means peacemaking. However, after Muhammad, which you learn Muhammad through those murderers or sultans and tyrants, the, if you are reading the Hadith books and Sira and the translations or tafsirs that is polluted through them, is very different. The teaching of Islam is very different, and the teaching of Jesus is very different than teachings of the Catholic Church or Byzantine Empire when they were committing crimes even now. And therefore, when I look at this, I don't look at the people according to their, when they are oppressed, I don't look at their religion or whether they are atheists or Christian. To me, is a human being is equal to another human being. 
regardless of their religion and race and gender. Therefore, I am with you, and I think that this is a major problem. In fact, they kill each other throughout history. They kill each other. But it is also valid throughout history. It happened among Christians, too. Not only medieval ages, even recently in last century, two world war among Christian nations. When there is war, we try to isolate Christians from the war, but in fact, it is uh, there. And you see, um, uh, when I look at the Iraq, and uh, you should not ignore, because the verses of the Bible, one of the verses, which is my favorite, says, accept the truth so that truth will set you free. Look at Iraq based on lies, United States attack, and it is supposed to be Christian nations, and uh, the government was mostly voted by evangelical Christians, and killed about, according to Doctors Without Borders, one million Iraqis. Do you think dropping bombs from sky when destroy people, maim their limbs, and uh, either wound them or kill them, children, men, women, if you go down that scene, it is not really a good scene. Therefore, we should empathize with them. We should condemn that too. But when I see Christians and Muslims, I don't know about you. You sound very nice person. But I see some well-groomed guys. They don't have any empathy for Palestinian children who were killed by Israel because they look at it through lens of religion or maybe this person is white or this black. I don't look at it. I don't discriminate between a Jew or a Muslim or a Western star. To me, we are children of Adam. We are brothers and sisters. We should not, whoever is this, the criminal, the one who commits suicide, uh, I'm sorry, suicide or genocide, we should all stand against that person, even if it is my relative. Therefore, okay. I am with you, but I think if you want to be effective, uh, you, you should stand for justice. I invite Christians and Muslims to stand for justice, to condemn the atrocities committed by Christians or Jews or Muslims, regardless. Right, but Mr. Edip, with all due respect, you know, I really appreciate your testimony, but speaking as of now, what's happening in Iraq and Syria, there are no Christians attacking Muslims. Muslims are at full force in attacking Christianity. As you know, the first city that was invaded was Mosul, Christian-dominated area. All of our homes were marked with N for Nazarene. So it is evident we can't be politically correct with these types of things. There is a radical Islamic ideology, Wahhabism, that is growing, and it is it's spreading like wildfire, like a cancer throughout the entire region. Even the governments of the country are concerned because the demographics are changing so rapidly. So my question to our two other guests, um, what do you think would be a great solution as Western countries to collaborate with Arab Islamic countries to resolve this ideology? Uh, for example, like the president of Egypt definitely admits that there's a huge issue. Something needs to be revamped. Something needs to be worked on. Because these people, some of these radicals, the way they're growing, the way they, they look at certain things and declare a jihad is their interpretation of certain things. So why are there so many people interpreting this as a radical jihad, to declare a jihad? And you know, even long before ISIS, we have been suffering jihad. You know, so many Christian families in Iraq, they don't know when they would have been attacked. You know, I recently also lost my aunt to ISIS. You know, this, is, this isn't something that's uh, exaggerated, something that's a conspiracy. This is occurring. It is happening today. Um, you know, there was a, a, an Assyrian Christian gal in Syria. There were over actually 300 that were kidnapped. We were able to collaborate together with the United States government. We were able to release some of them, you know, and one of them, a young girl, 13 years old, was forcefully married off to an Islamic radical um, because she was Christian. Now, they wouldn't do that to their own kind, now would they? So it's very unfortunate, and we can't sugarcoat those kind of things. We have to put them on the table. Otherwise, it will be pretty bad for both sides. It will be bad for the Muslims. It will be bad for the Christians. It will be bad for the Jews. We can never coexist if there is a radical. A but I'm sorry, Mr. Edub, this question is for uh, Dr. Acosta, Dr. Uh, Schumach. But, what know, do you believe is... You. 
What do you believe is a resolution, a solution for Western countries to collaborate with these Arab countries to revamp something? What do you believe is your solution, your idea? Well, first of all, the elephant in the room here is the Islamic worldview. Uh, Islam as a worldview, and I wish that there was an Islamic version like uh, Mr. Yuxos, because I've, I've never found one. I've never seen it in the history of Islam, a version like his. But the Islamic version of things uh, is the Sharia. Uh, the Sharia is not compatible with democratic values. There is no freedom of religion in Sharia. There is no freedom to express critically your opinion about the Quran, about Muhammad, and so forth. And the issue here is that the idea of equality is counterintuitive to the Quran. Now, Mr. Yuxo said that all human beings are equal, yet the Quran says in Surah 3 about the Muslims that you are the best of all peoples, evolved for mankind, permitting what is good and prohibiting what is wrong. And in Surah 98, I believe, verse 6, it says that the Jews and the Christians, those who do not believe in Muhammad, they are the vilest of all creatures. And so the concept that there is, even the dhimmis in Surah 929 who paid the jizya, these are not first-class citizens. They are subjugated classes. They are humiliated peoples. And what you were sharing with us, sister, about your family and even your grandfather, your great-grandfather and so forth, um, this is exactly the pattern that we see. Whenever Islam dominates, Sharia law is enforced. Christians are subjugated. They are given the, the option either you convert to Islam or you pay the jizya. Uh, and if you don't pay the jizya, then you are to be fought and, and destroyed. Um, and so I don't think there's a solution to the problem if Sharia law continues. The fact of the matter is some uh, Muslim uh, people, some reformists, want to reform Islam and go back and say, okay, we need to change. But the problem is you cannot reform a system that is fundamentally believed to be perfect and revealed by Allah. So how do you reform that which is perfect? So. I think what we have here is we, unfortunately, we have a dead end unless these nations are willing to embrace democratic values. Uh, the problem will never resolve itself. Well, you know, I appreciate it, Dr. Costa. You know what? We are getting close to our next break. We happen to have a couple of callers on the line who have been waiting patiently. At least one of them has. So I'm going I'm to actually uh, give at least one of them right now a chance to ask a question, and, and it's uh, Raphael. And Raphael, I'd like you to, ask, to say who the question is directed to, and please just ask the question and we'll respond in the interest of time. We don't, we're not looking for commentary if you don't mind. So yeah. Raphael, what is your question and who is it directed to? Oh, my question is to the, the gentleman, the Muslim gentleman. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, Yuxel. What's uh, your question? My question is, he, he is reasonable, but uh, actually the Islam is not uh, religion. The Islam it is it is religion uh, it is movement covered by a religion uh, religion covered to to control the the world and they ap apply the agenda now one of them ISIS I know the guy is not um, uh, uh, he's not uh, Sunni he she but, let's hear your uh, question let's hear your question my question is they apply the agenda in the Quran they should change the Quran and everybody will be happy. Dr. Yutzel, or Edip, what was your, what was your response to that? Hi, Chris. Hello. First of all, uh, I am much before you, long before you perhaps, Christian started criticizing uh, strongly condemning Sharia and Sunni Shiite religions. I was there in 1986, rejecting all these, put my life at risk. I have written a manifesto for Islamic reform. Look at that, you will see. The issue is not a religion. Religion is one of the components. When you don't recognize the, the main factors of the disease, there are other factors, and that religion is basically lost contribution, then you will not be able to find solution. For example, if a government attacked United States and killed uh, one-fifth uh, of the, uh, now one-twentieth of the population, you know, one million in Iraq, it were one out of 20, and uh, five, six million Americans here, do you think that any Muslim here would be safe? Of course, the Christians, they will attack. Even few Christians are being killed here. Now we say, well, let's go kill Muslims or evict them and stuff. 
Therefore, when, when you look at it as, please check that Chicago professor's research about the suicide attacks, it's strong, 95% strong correlation between invasion, imperialistic invasion and massacres and this kind of reaction. As far as for the verses, this gentleman, I will not allow you to attack the Quran unjustifiably because it is not honesty. When you attack the Quran, distort it and twist the verses and condemn the Quran because of ISIS. ISIS is number one enemy of the Quran or Saudi Arabia is number one enemy. You cannot, by looking at the inquis inquisitor, witch hunters and crusaders, you cannot condemn Christianity or Jesus, the teaching of Jesus. The same way, let, let me give you an example. Freedom of religion or freedom of expression in the Quran is given to the ultimate, ultimate measure, like verse chapter uh, 2, verse 256. La ikraf there is no compulsion in religion. Chapter 440 says, if they are, you are discussing an issue like with you guys, and you are making mockery of my religion, we are in the same room. And for me, if you are making mockery, you are not engaging in intelligent discussion, the Quran tells me leave their presence and then come back if they come on their senses, they are able to discuss. That's it. It doesn't say go hurt them, beat them, kill them, anything. This is made up by Hadith. It is not in the Quran. As far as verse uh, uh, about you are the best and stuff. Of course you are the best because the Quran describes the community this way. In chapter 49, verse 13 says, be men and women. I created you men and women in different tribes and nations. But the best among you is the one who is righteous. And righteousness is defined in the Quran. It means one. Is this this one? You don't, you are a free person. You don't submit yourself to other than God in terms of absolute uh, submission. You are charitable. You help the poor, the needy. You don't do injustice, even against your enemy. You are a peacemaker. You are a loving, caring person. Mr. Ajay, if so you are, are you in this case- that, Are you saying that Saudi Arabia is a huge issue in this? Absolutely, Saudi Arabia is the head of the snake. So is it because of their ideology of Wahhabism that Wahhabism, is brewing? Absolutely. Uh, Wahhabism basically is based on Sunni teaching. Sharia, Sharia is absolutely bad. Let me read a few verses. Let me read you for verses. Before you read those uh, few verses, Dr. Adeep, with all due respect, is it okay if we just want to ask um, their, uh, Dr. Acosta and Dr. Schumach, Dr. Schumach, uh, what was your idea uh, to resolve one verse, this? One verse, one verse from Exodus. Ex okay, go ahead. One verse. Kill witches, perverse politics. Another one. It is Joshua 6.1. <laughs> and they, div okay. There are many verses, hundreds of verses like this in the Bible, in the Old Testament, and even New Testament. It, Therefore, I cannot use this condemn you guys. Okay. Should I? No, let's, just, in the interest of time, we're getting okay. close to a break. Let's uh, let Dr. Dr. Schumach respond. Dr. Schumach. Right. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thanks, Edith, for your, for your ideas. And I, I agree with you that there are many factors that go into producing terrorism, and they're not all religious. And yes, there's been the, certainly occupation and people losing their land or feeling oppressed will play into it as well. But I think the key word that you used earlier was hypocrisy. And it is absolutely hypocritical for any Christian who follows Jesus to try and enforce their faith on someone. Now, I don't actually think that's what uh, the US is doing or the coalition is trying to do in the Middle East. It's not a religious war, it's, it's politics. But if there is any religious element, it is hypocr hypocritical. And as Tony was saying, the problem for Islam is that it's not at all clear that even if we, we get rid of the Hadith, even if we don't look at Ibn Ishaq and the traditions, and I, don't, I think the Quran becomes meaningless without that, but even if we say just the Quran, Islam is still left with a major problem because the Quran is full of uh, 
injunctions to fight. It's in chapter 2, 3, 4, 5, 8, 9, 16, 22, 24, 25, 29. There's this expectations that Muslims will be fighting for the sake of Islam. And that was the example of Muhammad. Clearly, he was not just a prophet. He was a judge. He was a warrior. And so you, it's clearly hypocritical for Christians to fight for Christianity. It's not at all clear that it's hypocritical for Muslims to fight for Islam, which means that it's not at all clear to me that an Islamist, Wahhabi, jihadist interpretation of the Quran is not legitimate. And so I think the Quran is part of the problem. Quick break here. We have one more half hour before we're done with our program tonight. And a lot of, obviously, a lot of uh, heated discussion and uh, a very interesting commentary. We'll be right back as. Uh, uh, come back after this uh, brief break and come on back with us. Thank you. Did you know that ABN has been on air for 10 years and started broadcasting to North America through the Galaxy 19 satellite? Now ABN and Trinity Channel programs are being aired to four continents through three different satellites. These satellites cover North America, Mexico, Central America and the Caribbean, Australia, New Zealand, North Africa, Europe and the Middle East. One of these satellites is Nilesat, the most popular satellite in the Middle East. Though the coverages are great and our passion is to spread the word of God to as many countries as possible in four different languages, this mission definitely has a big cost in our airtime. We are here to ask for your prayers and your support in bringing the truth from the word of God to the whole world and to set people free. You can support ABN in four different ways. Please visit our website at trinitychannel.com and click donate. You can go through the ABN apps or you can send your check to the PO box listed below or you can call the numbers at your screen. This is our International Apologetics Marathon and we are so thankful that you're watching our program tonight. Please, if you're being blessed by this program, let others know to tune in. Uh, tune in at trinitychannel.com. Also, uh, for those who watch by TCT, these live programs uh, should be aired, re-aired uh, in the next couple days on the TCT Split 4 antenna broadcast. And uh, please be praying for us. This is a Christian ministry. We depend on you, the body of Christ, to uh, support this ministry, to continue this uh, voice, this lone voice in the wilderness, if you will, uh, stating the truth uh, of the gospel of Jesus Christ, defending the Word of God, exposing the religion of Islam, other uh, religions that uh, are not the true one religion, Jesus Christ, Him crucified. Uh, but remember, we do not uh, wish to demean, we do not wish to belittle, and we certainly do not want to lie about other people's religion. You can support ABN in four different ways. Please visit our website at trinitychannel.com and click donate. You can go through the ABN apps, or you can send your check to the P.O. box listed below, or you can call the numbers at your screen. And we are back, and so glad that you're here, and it's so great to be here in the studio with you, Naren. Thank you, Chris. Same you're here. You know, and I should have said this, and some have already taken the opportunity to call. Uh, for those who would like to call, we have about another half hour before we're done with our program tonight. But the number, for those of you who don't know, and a reminder to those who do, it's 248-416-1300. Again, 248-416-1300. Our technicians are ready to take those calls and we're going to try to spread this next 30 minutes out as evenly as we can, giving everyone a chance to respond. And so in the interest of time, we do have a caller, and I'm going to ask this caller, Jackie, when she asks, or he, or whoever it is, uh, he or she asks the question, just to say who it's to and what the question is. We don't want to hear commentary. That'll be up to our guests. So please, Jackie, you are on. What is your question? Who is it directed to? Hi. Uh, this is, this is uh, directed to the... Um Oh, the Muslim gentleman? Edith Yuxel. Yes, yes. And because uh, I did watch him the other night, too, that he was on. And um, but here's my, my, my concern. My, my question is he's talking about, he's referring to Christians' war, Christians uh, fighting supposedly in the name of God or attacking people. And I, I, 
I'd like to know what he's referring to, because uh, number one in the Bible, there's nothing in the Bible where the Christians are told to go out and massacre people um, in, in the name of Christianity. So I, I'm concerned. He'll say, uh, like he's referring to the United States as a Christian nation, when I think he's confusing his politics with actual Christians and what the Bible actually tells us to do, because any type of... Um, War, and he re- keeps referring to the Old Testament, any type of war that was in the Old Testament where God had sent people in to basically maybe in some cases annihilate a whole thing. There were many, many, many yeah. years of warning to these people. These weren't just saying go out and kill these people. I mean, these people were warned, but I'm concerned on what he's, who he's referring to as Christians. And, uh, I mean, I, I, okay, Jackie, I, I, we're going to let him answer the question. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but again, we want—I appreciate. It. I think we understand the question. Thank you for watching, and thank you for patiently waiting yes, on the thank phone. You, and Jackie. We'll appreciate it. Your we want more of that, but let's give Edith Uxol a ch- uh, chance to respond. Hi. Hi. Uh, I don't see myself. <laughs> Should I? <laughs> uh, okay. Hello. Hello. Am I talking? We hear you. Yeah, hear my we voice. Can hear you. Okay. We can hear you. Good. Good. I didn't get the clue. Okay. Um, the question? Can you respond? Uh, first of all, I would like uh, to thank you guys. And I think uh, compared to last night, we have a much better uh, discussion of this issue. I appreciate uh, you are more congenial. Ye- uh, yesterday it was not. I was under kind of attack many people and uh, well, we it was very you. hostile. We appreciate it was very you, hostile. Yeah, but so. tonight, I, I know I disagree with some of your things, but I appreciate it. Thank you very much. We can all agree In to fact, disagree, but what, what would your answer be to the, to the question? I invite you to also to my shows. I have a YouTube channel uh, okay. watched by hundreds of thousands. Okay, here it is. Uh, today, Christian, there is no Christian uh, uh, government in terms of uh, officially Christian. But Christians support government through money and through votes. And the Christian supported governments we see in the Western world and like a majority of people in Germany, Christians, or in the United States, those who supported Bush, mostly Christians, evangelical Christians, especially supported Bush, which committed this. And he was himself a newborn Christian. Therefore, you may not use this because you got convenience. You can kill people at that time, say, well, it is the government killing, but you are financially and personally supporting that. And therefore, I see in this one a schizophrenia in Christianity. And you go sing peace in church, but go vote for more military, more wars. That is a major issue. People around the world, they see this hypocrisy. As far as uh, uh, the things, I do see the problem with the Muslim, uh, Muslim so-called Muslim uh, theology is Hadith and Sunnah. It is not the Quran. In fact, when I discuss with you, most of the things that is You think it is from the Quran, it is the distortion and pollution of the Sunni and Shiite religion. I have successfully argued and exposed this on TVs and in open public debates with top religious Muslim scholars and with Christians too. I have a book, uh, Peacemakers Got to Warmongers. I debated with Robert Spencer. I don't know whether you heard about him. Mm -hmm. It is a lengthy symposium, Robert Spencer, Ali Sina and Bill Warner. And then they came to me accusing Quran and uh, basically condemning the Quran, but what they were condemning really it was the distortions. Therefore, you need to be able to look at the Quran with a new eye. And uh, as I said, the uh, Leviticus and Joshua, Samuel, Exodus are filled with killing, children, murdering, stoning to death so much. But you don't bring this against Jewish people because you say, well, they are nice, they are good people. Well, they are committing crimes against Palestinians. You don't accuse their religion. You never bring these verses to condemn them. I do. I think these verses, a lot of them distorted in the Old Testament. I give you one example. Can you like give a, can you, can to you, death. Can you come, come to a conclusion quickly? We are running out of time. We have a couple the more conclusion, callers. I come one. The major issue is the clergyman. Hello. The major problem is the clergyman. They distort the message of every messenger. Chris. 
I'm, I, I'm listening. Do you hear me? And uh, they distorted like the Old Testament, like stoning to death. It is not in the Old Testament because the word regim, it is in the Quran too. It is not stoning to death. It's never used in the context of adulterer. There's no such a thing in the Quran. It is in Hadith. But in the Old Testament, stoning to death is there. But the word regim means to excommunicate. But in Old Testament, they distorted this word, the regime, from excommunication to stoning to death. And then Sunnis, they got borrowed from Judaic distortion, and they started continuing stoning to death. Jews not practicing this anymore because they are not following their religion. Edith, I'm going to have to have but you wind Sunnis, it up. We're going, to, we're going to give Dr. Costa a chance to respond. Well, Go thank ahead. you. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, all I would say, again, is... Um, for the honest reader, uh, Edip says the Quran says nothing about killing. Uh, Quran 9.5, slay the idolaters wherever you find them, take them captive, besiege them, prepare for them each an ambush. Uh, Surah 9.29, to fight against the people of the book who don't, do, not, um, do not accept Muhammad and impose upon them the jizya. Uh, Surah 8, I will cast terror into the hearts of your enemies and so forth. On and on and on, there are jihad verses throughout the Quran. So. Um, I think Edip is 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 uh, doing a, a, sanitize, a sanitization job here uh, on the Quran. So I would invite the hearer, the, the the listener tonight, open your Quran, read Surah Nine, read throughout Surah Nine, and ask yourself: Does the Quran teach violence against the the unbelievers? Now, uh, Edip keeps bringing up all these Old Testament texts, and of course, um, the the New Testament is very clear that God gave these laws in the Old Testament to Israel. These battles were historical battles. They're not to be repeated. They're not to be. Uh, um, they're not to be uh, imitated by uh, New Testament believers. Uh, we're under a new covenant. Jesus said that we are to love our enemies. We, those who live by the sword, will perish by the sword. And notice, he said that none of the Jews impose those laws. That's right. They don't impose those laws because they don't live in a theocracy. They live in a democratic country. Israel is a democratic country, and uh, Jews do not stone people for Sabbath breaking. They don't stone people for adultery. But Sharia states do, and that's the point here, is that it is the world view that dictates what is going on around the world. Now, once again, I would like to know uh, from Mr. Uh, Yuxel, where in Islamic history have we ever had a version of Islam the way he describes it? Peaceful coexistence, loving, respecting equal rights. I'm still waiting to hear a response. At what point in Islamic history was there any type of an Islam uh, according to to Edom. And uh, I'm sorry, but Surah 98, verse 6, read it again. It's very clear. Those among the people of the book who do not accept the messenger of Allah, Muhammad, they are the vilest of creatures. That is not talking about equality. Uh, and so I, I leave it to the hearer and to the listener. Don't take me for it. Don't take Edom's words for it. Pick up the Quran, read it for yourself, and let the text speak for itself. Well said, and, and I would love to get a response, but we're going to have to give... Uh... Uh, a chance for our callers. We have one more, actually two more. Yes, we have Nabil. 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 We could put Nabil on the phone. We're ready with uh, your question, Nabil. Uh, I started a little late uh, on the program, but I would like to uh, uh, forward the question to the, uh, uh, the uh, Muslim uh, guest, uh, yes. which is he ignored, uh, he confused the Meccan version with the Medina version. And these are... Uh, the Medina version abrogated all the Meccan version, which are the nice ones. Why is he doing that? And he's addressing, like, saying that we as a taxpayer, American taxpayers, uh, supporting the uh, military, then we become uh, invaders. In Egypt and in the Middle East, all the Christians are paying taxes to the government that uh, persecute them. Let's give him a chance them. to respond. Right, and actually I just want to add that to that too. Very good question, Nabil. And also, a lot of times the United States is referred to as constantly, you know, it's a Christian nation, it's a Christian nation. They refer to us as if we're like a crusading country. Unfortunately, um, it's not really, we like to believe that it's a Christian nation, but it really isn't. The United States, especially currently, it's helping Muslims more than Christians in the Middle East. For example, I'll give you my people as an example. We have been begging the United States to help our independent National Guard unit that we established out of our own pocket because so many different 
uh, national forces there withdrew their troops when we were being attacked by jihadists. The United States did not help us, was not funding us. Instead, they're funding the Kurdish Muslims. So that actually, you know, we're always referred to as a Christian Christian nation, but really Muslims have more rights in the United States than anywhere in the world. So, <clears throat> Edith, you've got the floor. Uh, we're, but, but be mindful of our time. Would you like thank to respond? You. Yes, thank you. Um, you are uh, four people over there with the colors, six, seven, eight people. Of course, I don't have time. And I think uh, you will declare victory because the gentleman doesn't have time to respond to you. Well, uh, that's not right. I invite you to have one-to-one -one discussion this with me. You will have equal time, even more time than I do. I do uh, provide this to my opponents. Here are the verses of the Quran that you take out of the context, like chapter 9, verse 29, you keep repeating. It is the context about people like ISIS, people like Christian crusaders, they are attacking.